What I want to do now is just introduce our speaker. Tom Crisp is a professor of philosophy in the philosophy department at Biola University. He works in metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of religion, and more recently on nonviolence and the ethics of love. A few years back when I first uh, discovered his work, I actually went to Notre Dame, and when I came into Notre Dame, he was just finishing Notre Dame. In fact, he had just finished, and he was kind of a star there. And People were talking about him as being like one of these great students, so I thought, well, that's cool. Let me read his dissertation. So he was the one dissertation that I read, and what was interesting to me was that the work in that dissertation laid the groundwork for current discussion now in a topic in metaphysics. But Crisp, being both intelligent and humble, let the philosophers continue to work on that topic in metaphysics, and he just leaves it and goes to this other topic to make real practical uh, impact on culture using the talents of his thinking. And so we're just so grateful, so honored that you can be here and just share your ideas and have this conversation with us. So Tom Crisp, it's to you. Well, thank you, Josh, for that kind introduction. And I'm so honored and delighted to be with you today. Um, and I see many uh, friends in the audience. I've gotten to know uh, various of your faculty members uh, over the years. And uh, you're so lucky, you students, to have such quality faculty. They're just wonderful, wonderful <laughs> scholars and human beings. Um, so I've been thinking the last few years about the the love uh, command, the, 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 more exactly the second love command, the, the neighbor love command, so the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. And I've been thinking about the bearing of that commandment on a range of topics, um, how to think about wealth and affluence, how to think about violence, how to think about our relationship to the state, how to think about prisons, how to think about um, capitalism various um, topics, but one of the topics I got interested in a few years ago was the topic of immigration and immigration ethics. So I've been thinking about the bearing of the neighbor love command on uh, questions in immigration ethics, and I'll share with you some thoughts. Uh, uh, these are um, some sort of, a, a kind of simplified presentation of some ideas I try to work out in a paper I'm working on. And so we'll see what you think. I'm very much in a learning mode on these things, uh, so um, I'm, I'm anxious to learn from you. Um, so every, every year, over 400,000 people, immigrants, asylum seekers, and in many cases, victims of human trafficking, are detained for months, sometimes years, in often less than humane conditions in immigration and customs enforcement ICE detention centers. And, um, it can be quite brutal. Um, one ICE official interviewed recently, uh, I, didn't know if he, I don't know if he was on the record when he said this, but he said, yes, it's brutal. Uh, we want it to get back to people who are thinking of immigrating here, that if you get detained, it's going to be terrible, and we don't want you to come. Uh, so first, detention. Secondly, uh, family separation. ICE records indicate that between 1998 and 2012, over 650,000 US-born children were separated from at least one deported parent. Oftentimes, to devastating effect, uh, the psychological effects of this kind of um, violent uh, separation from a parent on these children has been widely studied, and it includes um, uh, PTSD, uh, all kinds of behavioral problems, uh, depression, uh, severe anxiety, uh, 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 problems in school, behavioral problems, um, um, lasting for years. Finally, deportation. Uh, tens of thousands of deportees each year find themselves forcibly removed from networks of connection to family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, co-religionists, and deported to countries which they left long ago in which they have no meaningful support system. Either they don't speak the local language at all, or they speak it poorly, and they have no means of supporting themselves. And this, too, uh, comes at devastating cost to their well-being. Many, many of these folks end up um, uh, homeless, uh, um, uh, jobless, um, struggling with profound depression. Uh, suicide rates are high among these people. Um, uh, rates of severe poverty are high. It's a very brutal uh, situation these people are put into, and it's happening um, by the tens of thousands. Now, many will say that such treatment of what I'll call irregular immigrants and, and um, uh, uh, 
here I follow uh, uh, ter standard terminology or, or a piece of terminology that's become standard in the ethics literature. Um, irregular immigrants, the non-citizens living in a territory without authorization by the state governing that territory. So uh, undocumented immigrants would be another term. Um, the, but the claim or the thought is that such treatment of irregular immigrants is regrettable, but it's both necessary and morally justified. It's, it's necessary to protect American jobs or to protect our social safety net or to protect our culture and values to protect the rule of law, to protect against terrorists and other security threats, to protect against environmental and social catastrophe, some say. So it's necessary and it's morally justified, some will say, because such treatment of irregular immigrants is necessary to protect these and like interests of American citizens. The government of any nation state has a duty to its citizens to protect these and like interests uh, wherefore, such efforts are morally justifiable, part of a larger package of violent practices morally permissible for states on grounds of there being necessary conditions on the protection of a range of fundamental interests of their citizens. So my project is to look into the bearing of the commandment in Hebrew and Christian scripture to love one's neighbor as oneself, what I'll call the love command, on the claim that states are morally justified in entreating, uh, entreating irregular immigrants, asylum seekers, and their families in these ways. That's what, that's what I'm proposing to do. And I wanna argue that treating ordinary, so for, first, I'll argue for two claims. Uh, first, treating ordinary irregular immigrants, um, and by uh, ordinary, I mean um, those whom we've no reason to think are anything other than non-criminal people seeking honest work and a better life. And statistically, that is the vast majority of immigrants who come to our country. So I'm gonna argue that treating ordinary irregular immigrants, asylum seekers and their families in the above described ways, runs afoul of the love command and is therefore morally impermissible. And then I want to argue more strongly that attempts by modern nation states to forcibly exclude ordinary immigrants or refugees from our borders runs afoul of the love command and is, again, morally impermissible. So let me start off by saying a little bit about the love command and how I'm interpreting it. So um, love your neighbor as yourself. There are three parts to the love command. There's, there's the uh, love, and then there's your neighbor, and then there's as yourself. So the first question we might ask is, what kind of love is at issue here? What sort of love is being enjoined by the love command? And if you've read any C.S. Lewis on, on love or, or other literature, you'll know that there are a lot of different types of love. So which, which is it that's at issue here? And then the second part, your neighbor, who is our neighbor? Who's, who is the neighbor we're enjoined to love in this way? And then finally, what is the force of the as yourself bit? What is it to love? your neighbor, uh, quote, as yourself. So uh, let me start off with the first part, then love. I want to suggest, and I don't have time to argue um, for the interpretation of the love command that I'll, that I'll presuppose. So I'm just going to assert it. I'll tell you what I'm presupposing and then try to argue that some claims follow from it. Um, but in, in Q&A, if you have questions about whether this is the right read of love command, perhaps we can talk about that. But I want to suggest that there are two components at issue here, and I follow the Christian philosopher Nicholas Wolterstorff in, in thinking that um, love is, can be usefully divided into three main types, he, what he calls attraction love, compa or, or, or benevolence love, and attachment love. Um, and so attraction love is... Um, the, the love you have for something when you're drawn to it or in its grip because of some beautiful feature you discern in it and it draws you to it. And I think you might add to that that it, 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 it leads you to seek an appropriate kind of union with the object. So um, this can happen with, in a lot of different contexts, but for instance, um, if you see a beautiful landscape, uh, you, you are drawn to its beauty, you're in the grip of its beauty, and it really draws you to a kind of union with it. You, uh, maybe just a, the union of, of gazing lovingly at it for a long period of time, but, but uh, this kind of love can, can uh, uh, connect you to all sorts of things. Of course, romantic love is a kind of paradigm case of it, but, but there are other cases as well. So I, I hold that attraction love is one of the 
kinds of love at issue here, that it, and it has to do with appreciation of the dignity or worth of the beloved and the desire for appropriate union um, with him or her, and I'll say more about that in a second. And then secondly, I want to suggest benevolence love is being enjoined, and that's a matter of seeking the good, the well-being, or the flourishing of the beloved. So benevolence love is seeking the good of the thing you love. And so on one, attraction love, I want to propose that the kind of dignity or worth that's at issue in the love command in Hebrew and Christian scripture is the sort of dignity or worth that goes with being beloved by God and being an image bearer of God. So I want to suggest that each of us has um, a profound dignity, um, an enormous dignity or worth in virtue of being beloved by God, our heavenly Abba, and uh, being um, crafted in his image. And that that's the kind of dignity or worth at issue in the love command. And then secondly, and when it comes to the sort of benevolence love um, that's at issue, benevolence love seeks the good of the beloved. But it, as you know, um, if you've uh, studied any philosophy, or, or I, I would assume the same is uh, true in other fields, but certainly in philosophy, uh, philosophers uh, disagree among themselves quite a lot about what human good is. And, and so I think this, uh, there's a good case to be made um, exegetically from the text of scripture that the sort of good that's at issue in the love command is um, shalom, the good of shalom, where shalom is a communal state of well-being in which all enjoy material sufficiency. That is to say, this, the sustenance needs of all are met. Um, we all are, and enjoy safety against violence, attack, enslavement, and the threat thereof. Freedom, justice, enmeshment in a network of caring familial relationships, health, beauty, rest, and good work, and other what you might call basic human goods as well. So shalom is this very uh, uh, multi-textured, uh, beautiful uh, concept of human flourishing found throughout uh, Hebrew scripture and, in, and in, the, in the New Testament as well. And I want to suggest that that's the kind of good we're being enjoined to pursue for the neighbor. We're being enjoined by the love command to seek the neighbor's inclusion in shalom community. So that, then that's the, the, the basic uh, thrust of the love command. It's to seek the neighbor's inclusion in shalom community where shalom has these features and, and more. It's a, it's a pretty thick concept. And that takes us then to the uh, second part, the your neighbor part. So who is the neighbor in view? And here I'll just um, assert that as I read the parable of the Good Samaritan, the neighbor in view is anyone in need and in reach of your care. So the parable of the Good Samaritan tells us a story about the, the, um, the Samaritan um, 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 directing benevolence love at um, the robbed man. And what's interesting, I think it would have been shocking in that context, um, um, is the number of barriers that separated the two. So barriers of religious animosity and ethnic animosity, racial animosity, uh, barriers of ritual uh, cleanliness. And what Jesus seems to be suggesting is that the ordinary barriers that we think of as separating us from the other, uh, racial, national, ethnic, religious, political, um, none of that matters uh, for purposes of uh, the love command. So the love command says, reach across all of those boundaries, none matter, and seek um, your neighbor's shalom, where your neighbor here is really anyone in need and in reach of your care. And then um, the as yourself part, and. Uh, I'll here again just assert that I read that as enjoining that we seek neighbor shalom as one would normally seek shalom for oneself. That is to say that we put pursuit of neighbor shalom on a par with um, pursuit of shalom for ourselves. So um, I uh, expend enormous effort to pursue my own inclusion in Shalom community, I make that an extremely high priority. And I think what the love command is telling us to do is to um, put that same priority on pursuit of neighbor Shalom. 
So then pulling it all together, we get that we're to, we get this, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and I want to suggest that comes to this. Seek neighbor shalom, where your neighbor is anyone in need and in reach of your care, with reverence for her dignity and worth, putting pursuit of her inclusion in shalom community, that community in which the sustenance needs, safety, freedom, and dignity of all are secure, put all of that on a, put pursuit of all of that for her on a par with pursuit of that for yourself. So that's um, the love command as I'm reading it, and I want to suggest uh, something further about my read of the love command, and it, uh, my point comes from this bit of um, Romans, from Romans chapter 13, from something the Apostle Paul says. So he says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are summed up in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So um, notice that the commandments against adultery, murder, stealing, coveting, um, these are commandments at the heart of a Jewish conception of morality, the very center of it. And Paul says they are summed up in the love command. To treat the neighbor with love, says Paul, is to do no wrong to her. And so I wanna, I'm going to assume that the love neighbor command functions as a kind of summary statement of what morality requires vis-a-vis -vis treatment of the neighbor. And that to treat the neighbor in ways that go contrary to the love command is to thereby wrong her. So as I'm reading the, this bit of Paul, and there's a similar kind of comment in Matthew where Jesus says, the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says that um, the, the entirety of the law and the prophets hangs on the two love commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the same kind of point there, I mean, for a first century Jew, the law and the prophets sum up what, what, uh, what morality is all about. And uh, Jesus seems to be suggesting that the love commands, in an important sense, sum up the whole of morality. So I'm assuming then that this love neighbor command is not a... Um, a piece of teaching that applies somehow specially to Christians or specially to Jesus followers or somehow um, a special ethic for the age to come. But rather, I, I take it that this commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, really in an important sense, sums up what we owe neighbor here and now. So then toward defense of my first claim, uh, which again is uh, treating ordinary, irregular immigrants, asylum seekers, and their families in the above described ways runs afoul of the love command and is therefore impermissible, I want to introduce a parable that uh, it was first uh, introduced into the philosophical literature by a University of Colorado philosopher named Michael Humer, whose work on immigration I, I find uh, enlightening and, and, and wise. And, um, th this is uh, adapted from humor's parable. It's not exactly his, but it's, it's inspired by his. So Marvin's crops have failed and his family is facing starvation. He loads his handmade furniture into his truck and drives 200 miles to the nearest town to sell his wares at the town's marketplace. Sam, a regular at the marketplace, notices the stranger setting up his booth and inquires about it. On learning that Marvin will be selling furniture, Sam is upset. Sam's sons sell furniture in the marketplace, and Sam is worried that Marvin's booth will take away business from his sons. So he decides to act. Shotguns in hand, he and his sons confiscate Marvin's furniture and detain him in their basement for several months before dropping him off 1,000 miles away from his home. Marvin eventually makes it home to discover that his family has starved. So. Uh, I assume that most of us would think that um, Sam's behavior is morally awful, um, morally heinous. And different moral theories would have a different story to tell about why. Um, but from the standpoint of an ethics rooted in the love command, the reason I want to suggest that the behavior of Sam um, and uh, uh, 
his sons who helped him here, uh, was morally heinous is that it was a gross violation of the love neighbor command, the command to love one's neighbor as oneself. Intuitively, Sam and his sons were not putting Marvin's well-being or Marvin's shalom. Um, they weren't putting pursuit of that on a par with pursuit of their own. They were decidedly advantaging pursuit of their own shalom over his. And so um, you can put it like this. Um, infliction of violent harm on someone who seeks merely to meet his sustenance needs by honest work and poses no threat of wrongful harm to anyone. Uh, to do this in order to protect one's own economic interests is, I want to suggest, a textbook case of not putting neighbor shalom on a par with one's own. To treat someone thus is to fail to love him as one loves oneself, and therefore it's to wrong him. So the, the question is, the, the, the million dollar question here is, does this parable carry over in the obvious way to the case of immigration? And so, um, let's see. Here's the parable retold um, with the bits changed in the obvious ways, then the changed bits are, are in bold. So Marvin's crops have failed and his family is facing starvation. So he drives 200 miles to the nearest US town to sell his labor in the town's marketplace. Uncle Sam notices the stranger attempting to sell his labor and inquires about it. On learning that Marvin is an undocumented immigrant, Uncle Sam is upset. U.S. citizens sell their labor in the marketplace, and Uncle Sam is worried that Marvin's labor will lower the wages of his citizens and raise the cost of their social welfare programs. So he decides to act. Shotguns in hand, Uncle Sam's agents confiscate Marvin's furniture and detain him in an ICE detention center for several months before dropping him off 1,000 miles away from his home. Marvin eventually makes it home to discover that his family has starved. So the question is, um, what to say about this? Is, is this um, a moral analog of the um, um, unmodified Sam and Marvin parable? And I want to suggest that it, it seems to me that it is. It seems to me that the very same issues arise here. Um, so from the perspective of the love command, uh, it seems to me, infliction of violent harm on people who seek merely to meet their sustenance needs by honest work and pose no threat of wrongful harm to anyone as a means of protection of our own economic interests is a textbook case of our not putting these neighbors' shalom on a par with our own. To treat them thus is to fail to love them as we love ourselves. It's to wrong them. That's how it seems to me, and um, then I'll say that the treatment of Marvin described in this latest version of our story is close enough to the treatment of immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and so forth, described in the initial um, moments of my talk. Uh, so long detention in inhumane conditions, family separation, broken social connections, deportment to foreign lands, and consequent suffering. Um, all of that, I, I want to suggest, at least on the face of it, it seems um, uh, closely analogous to the um, 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 treatment of uh, immigrants described in this latest parable, as to suggest that if the treatment in this, of immigrants as described in this latest parable is contrary to the love command, then so is the treatment I've described of um, uh, ordinary irregular immigrants and asylum seekers um, that's uh, utterly widespread in our society. All right, so then here's my tentative conclusion. The above or earlier described violence against ordinary immigrants, asylum seekers, and their families badly conflicts with the love command and therefore constitutes wrongdoing against them. So. Um, that's my tentative conclusion, but uh, I, I say it's tentative because th these are subtle and difficult issues. Um, there's a whole range of objections you might put against um, this conclusion. And so let me uh, uh, consider a few of those uh, before I conclude uh, to this claim more forcefully. 
Um, so here are five objections, and we'll see what, how time uh, permits, uh, whether time permits me to get to all of them. I'm at, looks like about 22 minutes, so I've still got about 20 minutes. Um, so firstly, it's the law. Secondly, uh, terrorism, what about terrorism? Thirdly, illegal immigration is akin to home invasion. Fourthly, immigration threatens cultural cohesion. And fifthly, illegal immigration violates our right to freedom of association. So um, firstly, it's the law. So the objection here is um, that immigrants subject to detention, family separation, and deportation have broken the law. Uh, they've broken immigration law, uh, uh, either in coming here or in staying here. And because they have broken the law, says this objection, treatment of them in these ways is morally justified. So this is a way of putting the immigration, or rather the, the objection that underlies that, I think, ugly slogan that you'll sometimes hear in debates about this, uh, what part of illegal don't you understand? And I think that um, uh, slogan is, is meant to be getting at something like this. The, look, the law's been broken, and, and this is the cost of breaking the law, and it's, it's, it's morally justified. So there's a lot to say about this. This is a, a big, complex issue. But let me just try to uh, um, say something kind of simplistic in response that, um, in the way of another parable. So this is the parable of Sam the mayor. The first part of it will sound familiar, but it'll, it'll diverge from previous parables quickly. Marvin's crops have failed and his family is facing starvation, so he loads his handmade furniture into his truck and drives 200 miles to the nearest town to sell his wares in the town's marketplace. So far, so familiar. Sam, a regular seller at the marketplace, worries this will cut into his business. Luckily, he's the town mayor and can do something about it. He issues a mayoral edict prohibiting people from Marvin's town from selling furniture in the marketplace, then dispatches sheriffs to forcibly remove Marvin to a location some 1,000 miles away. Marvin eventually makes it home to discover that his family has starved. Now, my intuition here is that this is no less wrong than the earlier versions of the Sam and Marvin uh, story we've seen, that, that the fact that the mayoral edict that was issued was law and that the sheriffs were just acting to enforce the law, and, and my, my intuition, my moral intuitions tell me that that doesn't really matter here. And I think that's the diagnosis of the love command. Um, so I think the, the love command's analysis uh, of what, where Sam goes wrong in this uh, story is that enacting laws and enforcing them in such a way as to inflict serious harms on those who pose no threat of wrongful harm to anyone in order to protect one's own economic interests is a textbook case of not putting neighbor shalom in a par with our own. To treat people thus is to fail to love them as we love ourselves, and therefore it's to wrong them. And so too, you might think in the case of immigration, that someone has broken a law is no moral justification for imposing hard treatment on him if it was morally inappropriate to enact such a law in the first place. If enacting such a law and enforcing it puts a community in violation of the love command vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors, which so I've been arguing anyway, our immigration laws and their enforcement do, then it's no justification for imposing terrible treatment on someone that they've broken one of these laws. Okay, next, terrorism. So the Federation, this quote comes from uh, the webpage of the Federation for American Immigration Reform, which is a, a, a conservative um, uh, organization that's concerned about immigration. They say, um, while most illegal immigrants may come only to seek work and a better economic opportunity, their presence outside the law furnishes an opportunity for terrorists to blend into the same shadows while they target the American public for their terrorist crimes. So we live in an era where there is um, the widespread dissemination of um, morally um, beyond the pale terrorism um, of various kinds, uh, quite a bit committed um, by white supremacists, um, but also quite a bit committed by uh, Islamic uh, jihadist radicals. 
And so one has to say, this is a terrible thing and a real problem. Um, so I don't, I don't mean to gainsay that. Um, though there are empirical considerations relevant here to the question whether the enormous violence we visit on, Im on immigrant peoples um, is proportionate to the risk we face from terrorism. So um, according to a recent study by the Cato Institute, the, uh, the libertarian um, US-based think tank, the chance of an American being murdered in a terrorist attack caused by a refugee is one in 3.64 billion per year, while the chance of being murdered in an attack committed by an illegal immigrant is an astronomical one in 10.9 billion per year. So at, at the very least, uh, I think one could fairly wonder whether the level of violence we're visiting on irregular immigrants and asylum seekers and their and their families um, matches the kind of risk we face uh, from um, immigrant-based terror. But I, but I want to um, not focus on the empirical issues and instead uh, offer a more philosophical uh, response to this kind of worry in uh, um, the form of another parable. So here's the parable of Sam and the liver transplant. Ten people await liver transplants, nine of which will likely die before a liver becomes available. One is Sam's daughter. To increase her chances of survival, Sam forcibly detains the other nine in his basement until after his daughter has had the transplant. Several die in captivity. Sam is not a good guy in any of these parables. Apologies to any Sams in the audience. Um, so, okay, uh, I think all of us would agree this is no way to treat your neighbors. Uh, it's uh, uncontroversial. This is um, a morally uh, appropriate, appro uh, appropriate sort of uh, action. Um, from the standpoint of love command, it looks like this is the, uh, the right thing to say, that infliction of violent harm on those who pose no threat of wrongful harm to anyone in order to, to secure some interest of one's own even a vital interest, for example, a life-saving liver transplant for one's daughter, that even, to, uh, even in the case of a vital interest like that, infliction of violent harm on one who poses no threat of wrongful harm to anyone is a textbook case of not putting these neighbors shalom on a par with one's own. It's a textbook case of failing to love these neighbors as one loves oneself. I think that's the Love Command's diagnosis of a case like this, and it looks to me like something similar holds in the case of immigration. So here's the parallel diagnosis. Infliction of violent harm on immigrant peoples who seek merely to meet their sustenance needs by honest work and pose no threat of wrongful harm to anyone in order to secure some interest of ours, even a vital interest, for instance, safety against terrorism, is a textbook case of not putting these neighbors shalom on a par with our own. It's a textbook case of failing to love these neighbors as we love ourselves. To treat them thus is to wrong them. Okay, uh, next objection. Illegal immigration is akin to home invasion. Sometimes you'll hear this objection. So uh, here's one way of putting it. Uh, if someone invades your home, in the ordinary case, one has a right to forcibly expel them. Well, likewise for undocumented immigrants. So the thought is that this is a, a kind of home invasion on a grand scale, and, and just as uh, we would think of home invasion in the, in the small as uh, permitting uh, the forcible expulsion of the home invader, uh, so too it, it is argued in the case of immigration. So um, here my response is not in the form of a parable, perhaps you'll be glad to know. Uh, it's plausible that, uh, uh, here, I want to suggest this. It's plausible that we have a basic need for a small amount of personal space to call our own, a place to sleep, find shelter from the elements, store one's things, live together with one's close family or a family-like community, have a say over its character and arrangement, and have space for solitude and distance from others. I want to suggest that personal space is a basic good of shalom that it's a fundamental human need or interest. And in the ordinary case, when we think about cases of home invasion, a home invader does wrongful harm to this good. 
and is involved in, in visiting us with wrongful harm. But unlike home invasion, I want to say, an immigrant's mere presence in, quote unquote, my country isn't in and of itself a violation of any basic good of my shalom or yours or anyone's. It's not a basic need that I have say so over who lives, travels, and works in the large swaths of territory controlled by whatever nation state I inhabit. And so I want to suggest that unlike home invasion, an immigrant's mere presence in my quote unquote nation state does not constitute a threat of harm to any basic good of my, or for that matter, anyone's shalom. So I want to I want to suggest that the cases are importantly different. In the case of home invasion, there is um, almost always a wrongful threat of harm to me and, and mine, a, a wrongful threat of harm to a basic good of my shalom. But that's disanalogous, I, I suggest, to the case of immigration where an immigrant's mere presence is not in and of itself a wrongful threat of harm to anyone's shalom. So once again then, infliction of violent harm on immigrant peoples who seek merely to meet their sustenance needs by honest work and pose no threat of wrongful harm to anyone, what I'm claiming is that the immigrants' mere presence in the, within the boundaries of our nation state don't, um, uh, uh, doesn't by itself constitute a threat of harm to anyone's shalom. That, um, so therefore, infliction of violent harm on such people who pose no threat of wrongful harm to anyone in order to secure some interest of ours, even a vital interest, is a textbook case of not putting neighbor shalom on a par with our own and thus um, uh, a matter of wronging these people. Next, immigration threatens cultural cohesion. So here's the objection. Communities have an interest, it is sometimes said, in, preser in preserving their distinctive cultures. It's, um, immigration into a community threatens disruption of its culture, and preservation of culture justifies the violence of immigration enforcement, so it's claimed. So the thought is that uh, um, a community's culture is a beautiful and valuable, well, at least oftentimes, not always, right? But oftentimes it's a beautiful thing and, and, a, and a deeply valuable thing. And um, it is, uh, I think, arguable that uh, um, um, prodigious immigration into a community can disrupt its culture and even change it in important ways and even change it in unattractive ways, uh, ways that that denizens of that culture would, would, would feel deeply um, distraught about. And, and so th this is a real thing, this happens, it can happen, and some think that this is a justification for the violence of immigration enforcement. So here's a parable, again, um, that comes from humor, um, and it um, goes like this. Sam and his friends are concerned for years, the religious makeup of the sellers at the marketplace has been entirely Christian. But Marvin, a Buddhist, recently opened a booth there. It's important to Sam and his friends that the religious culture of the marketplace stay as it's been. They're concerned that Marvin's presence there might encourage others to become Buddhist and might result in the spread of Buddhist values, values Sam and his friends deem incompatible with the values of their marketplace. So they decide to act. Shotguns in hand, they confiscate Marvin's wares and detain him in Sam's basement for several months before dropping Marvin off a thousand miles away from Marvin's home, where he eventually dies of starvation. Now, intuitively, again, this is um, no way to treat someone. Uh, to treat someone thus is to treat them in ways that are morally impermissible, morally outrageous, even. And here's the uh, Love Command's diagnosis. Um, infliction of violent harm on someone who poses no threat of wrongful harm to anyone to secure some interest of ours, even a vital interest like preservation of our culture, is a textbook case of not putting these immigrants shalom on a par with our own, and so on and so forth. Um, um, so the, the, the idea is that, um, yes, we do have an interest in preserving our culture, but what are the means that are permissible to pursue that goal? Um, if, it, if it's a matter of imposing violent harms on innocent people, uh, 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 people who pose no threat of wrongful harm uh, to anyone, 
then according to the love command, as I'm reading it, uh, that is not a permissible means of trying to protect um, our culture. There, there may be um, other means of protecting culture that would be permissible by the lights of the love command, uh, various ways of trying to enfold people into uh, the culture that would be perfectly morally fine, but the kind of violence uh, that we're talking about, uh, says the love command, as I'm reading it, um, uh, is ruled out. And, and then I think the same exact thing applies to immigration. So uh, yes, we do have an interest in preserving our culture. That is a, a, um, a deep good uh, and would be uh, wonderful to do um, in many cases. But um, if the only way of doing it is to impose seriously violent harm on innocent people, the Love Command says that that's impermissible. And then uh, finally, illegal immigration violates our right to freedom of association. So here's uh, how this objection goes. Freedom of association is a basic human interest. So we have a, you might think we have a fundamental interest in being free to decide who we hang out with, who we, who we live with, who we uh, work with, uh, who we live around. Um, freedom of association is a fundamental human interest. The violence of our immigration enforcement practices, says this objection, is a necessary means of protecting this basic interest. Without the violence of our immigration enforcement practices, says this objector, we wouldn't have any way to guarantee that we can enjoy the freedom of association and associate with those in a political community whom we uh, want to be around. And so because it's a necessary means of protecting this basic interest, then therefore it's morally justified. So one more parable, the parable of Sam and the Bridge Club. So Sam and his bridge club like to meet at the corner Starbucks on Monday afternoons to play bridge. They always arrive early enough as to secure all the tables in the Starbucks for their club bridge games. Not today, though. Today, Marvin arrived early. Poor Marvin, he gets a rough time in these stories. Uh, so Marvin arrived early and is occupying a large table. Sam politely asked Marvin to leave, explaining that Monday afternoons, his bridge club uses this table. Marvin replies that though this may usually be so, today it won't be. He'll be using the table in, into the evening. Sam and fellow club members take umbrage and decide to act, forcibly escorting Marvin to the parking lot where they lock him in Sam's trunk for much of the afternoon. The weather is hot that day. Marvin nearly dies. Okay, so here again, it uh, uh, looks like this way of treating someone is morally out of bounds, um, uh, inappropriate, objectionable, heinous. Um, it's intuitively wrong. And uh, the issue, again, is violence. See, the, it is the case that we uh, have as a fundamental interest freedom of association. Uh, that's a deep good. Even, I think, a, a basic good of shalom. That living in shalom community means enjoying a, a high degree of freedom of association. But the question is, what is the means by which one secures this good? And if it's violence against innocents, if it's violence against those who pose no wrongful threat of harm to anyone, then it's ruled out by the love command. So here's the love command's diagnosis. Infliction of violent harm on someone who poses no threat of wrongful harm to anyone in order to secure some interest of ours, even a vital interest, for example, freedom of association, is a textbook case of not putting these neighbors shalom on a par with their own, and so on. And I want to suggest that the same thing holds in the case of immigration, that, that the, the, the two are tightly parallel. OK, so I claim then that um, one, treating irregular, ordinary immigrants, asylum seekers, and their families um, in the above described ways, uh, where here I have in mind um, detention in tough conditions, family separation, deportation, th that uh, all of that runs afoul of the love command and is therefore morally impermissible. And then more strongly, I, I I said I'd argue that attempts by modern nation states to forcibly exclude ordinary immigrants or refugees runs afoul of the love command and is therefore morally impermissible. So, so far I've been defending one, um, and, and that completes my defense of one. So uh, those are, I think, some of the 
the most important objections to my claim, and I haven't given them anything close to thorough treatment here, uh, but um, I've sketched how I think they should be uh, addressed, and so uh, that concludes my defense of one. And now I'll just say something very brief about two. Uh, the, the claim here then is that att attempts by modern nation states to forcibly exclude ordinary immigrants or refugees runs afoul of the love command. And here, here's all I'll say about that. Um, I want to suggest that it's very difficult to see how forcible exclusion, exclusion by way of coercive force, on the sort of mass scale necessary to affect immigration control in large nation states could work, if not by means like those we've been contemplating. Um, so um, now this could just be a failure of imagination on my, on my part. Um, but. It uh, looks to me like any kind of forcible exclusion, exclusion by way of coercive force, will have to work something like the way it in fact works um, if we're going to exclude um, um, and practice effective immigra immigration control in large nation states like ours. And so because that's so, I take it that a, a further upshot of the above discussion, which is treating um, ordinary immigrants in those ways, is um, impermissible by the lights of the love command, I take it that a further upshot of my previous discussion is the more general claim that for the vast majority of ordinary immigrants presently seeking admission to the US and other nation states, love rules out forcible exclusion. Actually, there's a slight misprint there. That should say for the vast majority of immigrants presently seeking admission to the US. And, and um, it, it the reason that's so is the vast majority of would-be immigrants seeking admission to the US or refugees or asylum seekers, the vast majority of them are ordinary in, in my technical sense, meaning um, they uh, are coming merely to find honest work and pose no wrongful threat of harm um, uh, to anyone. Okay, so then in closing, I want to suggest that there are deep tensions between Jesus' love teachings and our society's treatment of immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and their families. But this isn't going to end anytime soon. I mean, it, actually, when you study the history of this, it's surprising how recent this way of treating immigrants is. Uh, there, there weren't even a widespread use of passports among nation states until after World War I. And it wasn't until the late 19th century that there was any kind of serious uh, border enforcement of the kind that's, that's now standardly practiced. So it's not like this is an inevitable part of, of having a, a world um, geopolitical structure uh, structured by nation states. A uh, hundred years ago, things weren't this way. But they are this way now, it's, and it's, it's not going to change anytime soon. It's a, it's a kind of, I think, quixotic quest to try to have open borders enacted. That's just not going to be happening, given uh, present political realities. Um, so what it seems to me what we, Jesus followers and other devotees of love, must decide is how we will posture ourselves in a political context where this is an unchangeable reality. So will we support these practices um, by uncritically supporting politicians who uh, uh, affect such policies? Uh, I should say, uh, both Democratic and Republican. Um, it, it's, on, it's, being, it's happening on both sides of the aisle. Um, will we support these practices uh, by our uncritical support of, of political leaders or in other ways? Will we ignore the practices, uh, sit silently by and say nothing as um, hundreds of thousands of people are brutalized? Or will we stand in love against these practices and work to uh, try to change them over the longer haul, but in the, in the shorter term, work to persuade our political leaders to adopt more humane um, uh, practices to, to affect more humane policy? Uh, that's the big question. And with that, I'll say thank you very much. Uh, yes, hello. My name is Haroldo Solorzano. I'm the chair of the Department of Modern Languages. And I want to say to <coughs> Dr. Crisp that I, I thoroughly enjoyed your, your presentation. I had a chance to read some of his thoughts before. And it, 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 you're so thorough and so radical. <laughs> and uh, we, in the Department of, of Modern Languages, 
we we show a movie in, in our elementary Spanish 102 class. We show a movie called El Norte. And I don't know if any of you has seen this movie. Uh, it's a movie about two uh, Guatemalans that, that, that make the trip from Guatemala uh, to, uh, to the United States to avoid uh, uh, persecution, what is going on in, in Guatemala, and this is historical. Uh, and we, we ask our students to, to watch it. We, we show it in class, we, and, and we make sure they, they watch it. And when students see uh, these two characters after <laughs> several uh, minutes, or several, you know, they, they, they start getting into the shoes of, of these uh, this, uh, immigrants, and, and, and they begin to, to understand them. It's a, it has a sad ending, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, but uh, we, we use this uh, movie as a springboard for, for, for discussion. Uh, we feel that uh, languages, uh, when, when we study uh, language, we, it's a, <laughs> learning a language, it's, it's, a, it's an act of, of love. Uh, we, sometimes as students, uh, we, we tend to concentrate on, on, on the grammar, on, on the vocabulary, on the, the verbs and the syntax and all that. But the reason we learn a language is to be able to, to establish a bridge with, with, with other people. Uh, a few years ago, I read a book called The Gift of the Stranger by, uh, by uh, David uh, Smith uh, from Calvin College and Barbara Carvel, and, and they talk about uh, the concept of hospitality uh, associated to uh, teaching of, of languages. And the idea that when we learn a language, when we are studying a language, we are, uh, first of all, we are uh, hearing, we are learning to, to hear, to, to understand the other, uh, we are able to establish a connection with, with them. Uh, and the concept of hospitality, of course, it, 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 it permeates the, the, the book. Uh, we, in the Bible, uh, con hospitality, it's, 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 it's very important uh, because uh, the Hebrew people had been strangers, they, they, they had been away. There's always that commandment to to welcome the stranger, and, and it appears in, in, in several occasions, in, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Uh, in fact, when, when Jesus uh, is with, uh, I'm trying to think of, the, I think it's in, in Luke, uh, he is at a house with Simon, and Simon does not welcome him the way he should have. And, and Jesus takes an issue, and he says, hey, Simon, I came to your house, and you didn't. You didn't offer me water to wash my, my hands. Uh, you didn't uh, kiss me. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't annoy me. But, and then he talks about this woman who, who had done that. Uh, later on, uh, in Matthew 25, 35, Jesus personifies this stranger saying, uh, I was hungry <laughs> and you fed me. Uh, and I was thirsty and you, you gave me something to, to drink. Uh, we feel very strongly that the language uh, allows us to do a, a, a connection with, with our, our students, with, with the foreigner in our midst. And I, I really appreciate your, your talk. I think that it's very radical. Uh, love is it's, it's at the heart of, of the gospel. And we can see so many times in the Bible uh, Love one another. You know, love. This is what you should do. Love, 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 and do as I did. Love. So, thank you. That's all I have to say. Uh, Marcela Rojas from the Department of Languages, also in Ethnic Studies, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. We really enjoy reading your your paper, and then uh, the radical part. And today. 
I was um, joking with some people saying, what if I go and prone and say, open the borders? It's not going to sound really good unless you say it, but not me. But anyway, uh, I was uh, reading at the end uh, uh, of your uh, article, um, because we know about that we need to love our neighbors. It's, it's not like a new thing. And, uh, and reading more about um, the other and uh, Levinas talking about the responsibility that we have. Uh, towards the other, it doesn't matter uh, how that person looks or their culture or they have an accent or they look weird. Uh, I have a responsibility and uh, um, when I learned that uh, years back, I was like, uh, okay, you know, that's anyone is my neighbor and I don't suppose to see anyone like uh, inferior than me, but uh, you know, uh, just see them probably uh, superior and uh, treat them the way I supposed to treat them. So I was reading about um, Norberto uh, Santos Cruz um, a few days ago. He was trying to cross the border and uh, well, he was detained and he was in his cell and after a week of being in his cell, he decided to hang himself. Uh, so imagine how his family is feeling. And sometimes we need to be the voice for those and not just uh, talk about statistics. 10,000 people since 1994, uh, they died just trying to cross the border. Why they are trying to cross the border? The border? Why they are leaving their families, their kids, their culture, their language, everything they know trying to cross the border. I don't know how many of you knows how hard it is to get a visa to enter the US and how expensive is that? Sometimes it takes six, uh, six months before they tell you, sorry, no, try in six months and then we'll give you an answer in another six months. You know, this is really hard. And then you have to understand why people, and I'm talking about Latin America, I cannot talk about other countries, but my experience. And you know what, when I moved to the US, I, I, I couldn't relate very much to people in my church when they were telling all the stories, like uh, my daughter died, or please, pastor, because my husband was the pastor, and he, they, they were like, pastor, can you, pray for the coyote that is, cr is going to cross my field. And we were like, I'm going to pray for that, you know. Uh, and I couldn't relate to them because that's not my story. And I think that until you know names and you know people, then you can relate and you can love your neighbor. Because honestly, saying I'm going to love my neighbor and I'm going to take care of them and, you know, I'm going to take care of the people that I know, my neighbor that I know the name, you know, I'm not going to... And when I was reading the, the Sam's daughter thing, I was like, uh, I don't know if I will do something like that for my daughter. I don't know, you know? <laughs> uh, so that extreme. And uh, um, people do extreme things for their family. Uh, and then uh, 10,000 people uh, die uh, in these uh, past years. And we don't know all the people that die and we couldn't find them. You know what I'm saying? And their, their families are back thinking, oh, they made it. Probably they have a, fam a new family, et cetera. I'm happy for them. So no idea about, about them. So we, we need to understand this um, 11 million uh, people with not documents living in the U.S. Half of them are from Mexico. And if you know a little bit of history, you will know that uh, there is a history with Latin America that sometimes we don't want to talk. Just when I was listening to you, I decided to, uh, to just uh, check uh, online um, because we were talking about invasion, your home, and that kind of thing, you know? And then I was looking, and almost every two, three years, the U.S. been inviting other countries in Latin America or helping with money to help with cops, you know? And then we never talk about these kind of things, that we've been inviting other countries for our own interests. And then we don't understand why people are coming to this country. Believe me, interview any person. Nobody wants to move to the US. Nobody wants to move to the US. They want to stay at home, but they are, you know, pushed to do this. And then the second thing is try to find out who is the people who move to the US, you know, that go through this uh, distress to, to get into here and then uh, to feel like uh, sometimes they are not at home. 
they don't feel at home sometimes, you know? And then we go back to the DACA recipients, you know, when so many people, they are like, a, well, this is the only country I know, you know? And then I'm from here, but uh, they say that I'm not from here. And then I have to go to a country that is not my country. So it's really, um, really complicated. I'm taking more time than what I think, but I just want, uh, I was uh, singing yesterday at church, um, that song that I'm not going to sing, but uh, hey. is that, I don't know, the music anyway. Uh, there is no borders in your love, no division in your heart, God of heaven, God of freedom. And, and that's what we need to remember, you know, who made the borders and my responsibility to the other. And we need to uh, talk about this more and we need to know more about history and understand why people are leaving everything to come to this country. Thank you. All right. Um, my name is Justin Ashworth. I'm a new assistant professor here in, in theology. Um, thanks for uh, having me come. Uh, we were told to uh, talk about, uh, re respond to Professor Crisp's uh, talk from our own disciplinary perspective. Um, and so I will offer some uh, theological and biblical reflections because um, I too uh, work at the uh, work on stuff with relate uh, with respect to theology and immigration. Um, I want to take my reflections from uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Now, Bible scholars in there, some of you aren't sure that that's written by Paul. Whatever, um, we're just going to call him Paul right now, okay? Um, and um, I think that this letter gives us a vision for understanding uh, God's purposes in the world. And in fact, uh, purposes, plans, mystery, these sorts of things come up over and over um, in Paul's letter. Um, early in the letter, we learn that God's plan for the world um, had always been to unite all things in Jesus Christ. So in, the, uh, in chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, with all wisdom and insight God has made known to us, the mystery of God's will, according to God's good pleasure, set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, Jesus, things in heaven and things on earth. And later in this letter, we learn that this gathering of all things includes the gathering of all peoples, Jews and Gentile citizens of the commonwealth and aliens to it. All are invited and summoned to the foot of the cross. And this, says Paul, is part of the mystery that God had hidden from all eternity and is now revealed in Jesus Christ. So according to Paul, this uniting of Jews and Gentiles took place in the blood of Christ. Jews and Gentiles now have access to God in Jesus Christ. The hostile wall, yeah, hostile wall, that once divided Jews and Gentiles has now been broken down. Where once there was hostility, now there is peace, 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 peace. Paul emphasizes that word, saying it four times in four verses. Indeed, in Jesus Christ, these Jews and Gentiles are already in some sense brought near to each other, united to each other. And Paul, you see, doesn't care only about spiritual unity, as if bodily unity were irrelevant. One of the crucial fights in the early church, you all probably know from your New Testament class, um, was how exactly to get Jews and Gentiles to get along with each other, to, to tolerate each other, even perhaps to love each other, right? And Paul sought to help his congregations to discern how to live as people united in Jesus Christ. Some of us might be tempted to say that the fellowship we have in the Spirit is maybe more important than any fellowship we have with each other in person, face to face. And yet our common faith has to be worked out in love. And love is inescapably bodily. Um, a recent theologian has said that without bodily presence, there is no real solidarity. And I think you could substitute the words love and unity for his word solidarity without any loss of meaning. So to love one another, to be united with another, we must be bodily present with them. And borders make this impossible. 
Division is not a sad consequence of borders, it is their very purpose, which is at cross purposes, you might say, with God's own purposes. Now, all well and good, you might say, but what I've said is about the church and not about nation states. Maybe so. Um, so does this have any bearing on political communities? And the answer is yes, for two reasons. The first is that the church provisionally shows the world what salvation looks like. And this doesn't mean that the church's salvation, clearly it is not, but it does mean that the church knows the direction of history, where God is taking things, and it offers the world a foretaste, even if only small, of God's future in its own life. God is leading history towards peaceable fellowship among all peoples, not towards a bordered world. And so the church of Jews and Gentiles that Paul was speaking to in Ephesus, this is a worldly expression of our Christian response to God's saving work in the world. That's one reason why this has a bearing on political communities, because the church is a provisional embodiment of salvation. A second reason is that everyone is called to respond to God's work in the world, not just Christians, everyone. In the words of the letter to Ephesians, through this Jew-Gentile church, God makes known the riches of divine wisdom. This is in chapter 3, which is God's plan to unite all things in Jesus Christ. And God makes this known not just to individuals, but to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And so in Ephesians, the gospel is called the gospel of peace, peace comes up surprisingly frequently in uh, the letter to Ephesians. I was surprised. Um, and what is it called when we make known uh, the gospel to people, when we tell people, the, uh, tell the world about God's plans for it? Of course, this is called evangelism. So then preaching against hostile dividing walls on the basis of the fellowship, the peaceable fellowship that we're given in Jesus Christ, to preach on this basis is to preach the gospel. And preaching against borders, of course, is not the whole of evangelism, but it's certainly part of it, and an important part of it in our own day. And all of this, to come back to Professor Crisp's article, coheres perfectly, I think, with the love command. You can think of what he said as um, a way for us to fulfill God's commands to us. I'm trying to paint a picture of God's ways with us. Um, you could say that the law of love is a fitting response to this gospel of peace that I've discussed. Um, the love command is what we, what we must do to maintain peaceable fellowship, the peaceable fellowship God has invited us into in Jesus Christ. And so, in short, I think that both the gospel of peace that I want to talk about, as well as the law of love, forbid the perpetuation of the hostile borders that you talk about so eloquently. Brian Lampkin, I am a member of the Department of History, Professor of History. I do U.S. History in particular, and my scholarly research involves uh, immigration, so I'm an immigration historian. So um, some summary points uh, that I take from your talk and your paper. First of all, some, some reminders from your talk. Uh, your talk reminds us that the love command really should be foremost in our minds as Christ followers. These concepts of shalom, of human flourishing, of inclusion, um, these are wonderful, exceptional principles that, that we as Christ followers um, should keep at the top of our list. Another uh, thing that I really liked about your talk, uh, it reminds us that contemporary issues like immigration have deep connections to scriptural principles. Uh, we so often think these are different worlds, and, and you've pointed out how there are very solid connections between biblical principles and this contemporary issue. Uh, a third point I would say is I should be careful 
with my relationships with anybody named Sam. I'm going to avoid <laughs> people named Sam from now on because I, you know. Um, and I think another thing that I really liked about your talk was it reminds us that sin really has infected our world, hasn't it? And that many, many of our systems, including immigration, they're broken. And we talk about our culture and the selfishness that comes into that. It's just a reminder that we have many, many battles to fight as Christ followers. But I'll give you some food for fodder. Um, the rest of the panelists didn't give you a lot of, you know, attacking points. So let me give you some things to think about that maybe you can respond to. Um, I had some difficulty with the, the Sam Marvin and the real world comparisons. And I wondered if sometimes these were kind of um, ad absurdum kinds of examples, uh, straw man kind of examples. So you compare uh, Marvin and his friends kidnapping and taking Marvin into various places and almost dying and so forth versus ICE agents that are enforcing the law. And I know you're trying to get at the love command here, but in many ways that's really pushing the boundaries of, of good comparisons. And I, I wondered about that. Um, if one commits a crime, does the government have the right to impose sanctions, to impose punishments on those people? And I think the answer even biblically is yes, uh, we have the right to do that. So that's one point. Um, I wonder too about the consistency in, in the biblical standards that we're, we're talking about here and the responsibilities of immigrants with, within the biblical scriptural framework. Um, so the love command becomes utmost in your framework in this paper. And again, I, I love that. Um, I love the love. Uh, reminds me of so many songs, right? Should we break out in song here? Um, but, but how about our, our, our scriptural ideals to obey government? Right? Government is instituted by God. And so we are to obey government. And some would say, well, but this government today is, is nothing like the government of that time. Um, well, the Roman world was the world in which, this, in which we're called upon to obey government. So uh, I just wondered about that. And, and immigrants have a responsibility in scripture. Now we don't have the word immigrant, of course, in scripture. But we have words like sojourners, strangers, um, and there, though we as Christians, as God's family, are called upon to love them, to include them as the family, to join them into our community, the immigrants themselves, sojourners, strangers, aliens, are called upon to obey the laws of the land. So there's this. There's, there's a mutual responsibility, which is really tough to figure out in contemporary kind of practical issues. A um, couple minor points there. Um, in the love command, it seems to me that uh, one of your solutions is the, the open borders, right? That's, that's, one of the that's one of the natural ramifications. And in your paper, you say, even if that results in a dystopian society, we, we need to follow that. that that's okay. Yeah, I'm, you know, a little nervous about that, but maybe you can comment on that. And just one final thing about U.S. immigration standards. Uh, we, we're doing a lot of generalizations about U.S. immigration and its ideals and numbers and so forth. Uh, we currently have somewhere between 40 and 45 million, really the estimates are, are wide, uh, immigrants in the U.S. as of 2017. That's over 13% of the U.S. population. So we are, always have been, a nation of immigrants. So there's this tendency to say everything we're doing is, is anti-immigration. Um, and I'm not quite so sure of that. In 2016 alone, we allowed a million and a half legal immigrants into the, into the United States. 
The rest of the world combined, depending on which figures you, you use, and allowed um, about 3 million immigrants in 2016, all the rest of the countries combined. And that's depending on the kinds of standards used. So we do a pretty good job of accepting an awful lot of immigrants, even though the system is broken and there's a lot of reform to be done. So um, just some, some points to think about there. Um, I, I hope I was kind in, in the way I said those things. I told you I was going to rip you apart at the beginning of the meeting, but I really wasn't promising that. Thank you for your talk, though. So um, many, 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 many thanks for your remarks. It's a, it's a terrific honor for me to hear from you, uh, the four of you, and to have your interaction. Um, and, and it's tremendously helpful to me, so thank you. Um, so let me just, um, um, so Araldo, um, I, I really love your point about um, the, um, how the learning of language is itself an act of love. And it's such a beautiful picture that one of the uh, driving motivations for studying foreign language is to be able to move into a relationship of, of love um, with our neighbors. And uh, it's just a lovely image. Um, uh, one of my colleagues uh, who teaches Spanish at Biola um, 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 has said very similar things and tried to motivate the case for a robust foreign language program at Biola in just that way, and it's a beautiful idea. Um, so uh, thank you for your remarks. Um, Marcella, um, you mentioned that in recent years, 10,000 people had died trying to cross the border. It's just an unbelievable human tragedy. The question is why? Why did they try to cross, knowing full well that it could mean death? And I thought it was worth pointing out that many, many, many of them, the reason they were crossing was to return to their children, whom they'd been separated from. And that, I think, adds an element of poignancy to it. I mean. Uh, for those of you who are parents, to be separated from a child would, would, I think, be one of the worst human tragedies one could endure. And so you imagine um, people who have endured this horrific thing and then being willing to cross deserts uh, to be reunited to their kids. I mean, the, the, the depth of human tragedy here is profound. Um, and then you suggested, too, that unless you know people you don't love, and um, I wanted to suggest that there's something profound about that, that Jesus calls us, I think, not, not to just do advocacy work, not to just practice charity, but he calls us to stand with, to come alongside, to, to, to stand with those who are being marginalized for whatever reason, and to um, try to be... Um, a friend and a, and a support, but in a posture of standing with, and it's. And I was glad that you brought that up. So, uh, for those of us that are concerned about immigration justice, this isn't an issue. It's people that we are called to stand with, and I appreciated you pointing that out. Um, Justin, I th um, appreciated your unpacking of Ephesians in the way you did, and um, was struck by the frequency of the occurrence of, of, the, of peace. Uh, it wasn't something I had noticed about Ephesians. But I really do suspect, and, and I defer to uh, biblical scholars here, defer to you on this, but I do suspect that at the heart of Jesus' kingdom vision, which Paul then inherits, is the idea that as the kingdom is now breaking into reality, that that shalom prophesied by the prophets is breaking in with it. And so as we get swept up into the inbreaking kingdom, um, bubbling up in these little communities of shalom, churches, ecclesias, um, we are going to be experiencing the, that, that shalom that the prophets talked about. And, and I think once you get gripped by it, once you get a taste of it, you can't help but start worrying about how people are being treated, um, but whether people are, are having access to that shalom. Um, and um, 
Uh, I also appreciated your point uh, that without bodily presence, there is no solidarity. Um, so that, and that goes to Marcella's uh, point. So right, uh, bodily presence, standing with um, is, is, is what's required uh, for real solidarity, and I, I sure appreciated that. There are really deep and interesting questions. You raised two excellent reasons, I think, about why we should think all of this bears on political communities. So suppose it is the case that the Love Command uh, su suggests that th the way we're treating um, irregular immigrants is impermissible. Well, what does that have to do with nation states, you might say? They're not governed by the Love Command. And you raised two really good reasons for thinking that the, that the the gospel vision is relevant to political communities. And, and I'll just raise another one, and that is that um, even, if it, even if you could make an argument that somehow we shouldn't expect nation states to be governed by the morality of the love command, I, I, I think there is an argument in the neighborhood of, of uh, Luther's uh, two kingdoms doctrine um, or teaching that um, you could make along those lines. Um, I, I think as Jesus followers, though, um, uh, who are devotees of love, we should be really hesitant to be complicit in loveless treatment. I mean, m maybe maybe the government in some sense is operating by its own morality, but I, I, I would think that as devotees of love, we would not want to be complicit in treatment of people that goes badly contrary to the love command. And so um, uh, I, I think that's another reason uh, why Jesus' love teachings bear on our posture toward um, political structures, political leaders, is let them do what they do, but we don't want to be complicit in their treating people in ways that go badly contrary to the love command, which we try to live by. Um, now, Brian uh, r raised several um, uh, trenchant worries about my project, so thank you uh, to Brian uh, for that. Um, we were joking before it started uh, that uh, one of the commandments just preceding the love command in, in Le Leviticus is uh, the commandment to um, rebuke your neighbor so as not to share in his sin. And then you might think that the love command is kind of a summary of the commandments that came before it. So part of loving your neighbor is rebuking him so as not to share in his sin. And this is what Brian was doing for me. He was... He was loving me. Um, so um, let me just quickly respond, or uh, uh, point in the direction of a response to uh, some of Brian's points. Um, so he suggests that uh, the comparison between ICE agents and Sam is strained, because these are, after all, uh, agents of um, legitimate political authority, whereas Sam and his friends were vigilantes, in effect. Um, and, and Brian wonders, doesn't the government have a right to punish crime? Um, so what I want to say about that is it depends on whether the law they're enforcing is a just law. So um, the agents of a governmental power were used during World War II to, to punish people who escaped from the Warsaw ghettos. Um, but I don't think that that was a legitimate um, use of state violence. I don't think that, that the, the agents of the uh, Polish government who were punishing people for, a, who were punishing Jews for escaping from the Warsaw ghettos, I don't think that they were acting in a morally justifiable way, even though they were um, agents of a government and acting to enforce the law. I think all turns on whether the law that's being enforced via the um, mechanisms of state violence is a just law, and I think um, that's a that's a deep question. What makes it, it's a deep question? What makes a law just? What makes for a law as being just? But I think a mark of a just law is that it can be enforced without violating anyone's rights. That's to say, it can be it can be enforced using the coercive power of the state without wronging anyone. And I think that in general, if you use coercion against someone who is not a threat of wrongful harm to anyone, um, I think if you, use coer if you use coercion against someone who is not a wrongful threat of harm to anyone, hasn't consented to being treated thus, those, I think those are the, sort of the two things at the heart of legitimate coercion, um, then you're you're wronging them. Um, you're, you're violating their rights. And so I think that 
uh, an unjust law uh, will be one that if it's enforced via the coercive power of the state against people who don't pose a wrongful threat of harm to anyone and haven't consented to being treated thus, then I think that um, enforcement of that law is not just, the law is not just, and um, agents who engage in that kind of treatment of, of um, um, their fellow humans are wronging them, even if they're uh, agents of a legitimate government. Um, then uh, Brian asks about scriptural ideals to obey government and, and points out, quite rightly, that uh, immigrants have that responsibility too, that we all have a, a scriptural mandate to obey our leaders, and isn't that true with respect to immigrants? And here I wanna say that, again, it depends on um, the circumstance. There are cases we see in scripture where uh, the apostles will say we must obey God, not men. And so it depends on whether the law is just. It depends on whether governing authorities are asking for something um, against the dictates of morality. If so, we don't have an obligation to obey them. And I, I want to suggest that forcibly excluding people from our borders who um, are um, honest people uh, seeking merely to provide for their families is, is uh, to wrong them. And so um, to treat them thus is to treat them wrongly. And, and thus, that it's not as clear that they have an obligation to accede to that kind of political um, authority or that kind of use of political authority. And um, Brian asks that this, uh, in my paper that this talk was based on, I, I do suggest that um, w what happens if we were to all of a sudden open the borders? And there's some reason to think it's, it's a disputable question that ec economists who study this dispute about what would happen, but the, at least some economists think it would be catastrophic, that there would be a massive flood of immigrants into the country, something like a billion immigrants in a fairly short order, and it would result in massive societal changes, and in certain ways these changes would tend toward dystopia. And, and what about that? I mean, do I think that really we should practice open borders even if it means this kind of dystopian scenario? And here I wanna say, um, well, um, what I'm mainly interested in is, is the question uh, of use of violence against innocent people, the violent use of violence against people who pose no wrongful threat of harm to anyone. And, and what I wanna say is you cannot use violence against innocent people even if it's to protect against a really difficult circumstance, like a dystopian scenario of, of the sort I just adumbrated. But I, I don't wanna suggest that no resistance would be permissible. I mean, it could well be that um, enough immigration um, um, could be uh, utterly destabilizing in a way that would warrant some kind of um, um, uh, resistance to immigration in the form of making it harder to get work permits or, or, or maybe, maybe a more strong kind of resistance of the sort that we would see in um, Gandhian um, uh, nonviolent direct action. Um, so you might think that one way of understanding, well, I, I won't go into that, but, but I do think there are scenarios under which you can engage in a kind of resistance to harmful immigration that is nonviolent and doesn't involve doing, uh, visiting violence on innocents, and that might be morally justifiable given the principles I've laid out. Um, and, and then finally, to Brian's point that it's, it's not as simple as the U.S. being all bad with respect to immigration. I mean, after all, we are allowing an enormous number of immigrants. I want to say, yes, I, I think that's right, and I grant that, that. I don't mean to suggest that the U.S. is all bad in this respect. Uh, we have been a nation of immigrants, and much that we've done by way of immigration policy has been good. And, and um, so I'm, I'm mainly concerned about the violence we're deploying against undocumented people at a, at a large scale. Um, but I grant that much that we've done over the years has been good and admirable. So thank you uh, all for your comments. So Tom, nice to see you. It's really nice to have you out. Um, so it seems like one of the, the things that makes this ethical issue complicated um, has to do with the, the moving up of levels from the 
the individual level to the level of government from the level of policy, right? So, you know, the, you have the, the early church and the church fathers, and even up through Augustine, a lot of the, the articulation of a, of a Christian ethic and what it means to love your neighbor is all done in this context where there's not really an option, you know, to be determining the, the policy of empire. Um, so when we think about what it means to think Christianly about moving up a level to the level of government, the level of policy, um, one of the things that seems, uh, one of the questions that seems to be key to figure out is whether government, um, whether the putting of the, the shalom of non-citizens uh, on a par with the, the forwarding of the shalom of citizens is something that it is reasonable or feasible to hold governments to? Like, can you speak to how uh, feasible or advisable it is for a government, qua government, to put the shalom of non-citizens on the level, on the same sort of level as the shalom of citizens? Yeah, I think that if you think carefully about the logic of the love command, that you'll, you'll, you'll see, you'll think it plausible that there's an important distinction between doing harm to shalom and allowing harm to shalom. And so um, what I think that a fuller explication of the love command would have to include the idea that we're called to love neighbor in ways appropriate to the morally significant relationships we bear to the neighbor. So, so Paul says the love command is the summary of the commandments of the Decalogue. Well, one of them is um, love or honor your father and mother. And so it looks to me like as Paul was thinking about love, love has room for, spe for, for special obligations to loved ones. And, and, it, 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 and, and I think one thing that that might mean is that when you face a choice between allowing harm to someone X and allowing harm to someone Y. If X is your parent and Y is a perfect stranger, it may well be that you have to allow harm to the stranger and preference your parent. So I think there's room in the love command for the idea that when it comes to the choice as to allowing harms, you should uh, prioritize those to whom you bear relationships of special obligation. Um, but, the, and here this would take argument, but I try to argue in this paper that, I'm, that this talk is based on, I try to argue that that doesn't, that stops it when it gets to the doing harm. So I can't do harm to a perfect stranger who's innocent to promote the well-being of my child, even though I have an enormous degree of special obligation to my child. So I think allowing, when it comes to allowing harms, there's room to think about special obligations and to think that we should privilege or prioritize those to whom we have special relationship. But that, that, that doesn't carry over to the case of doing harms. I can't do harms to people even to protect those to whom I have special relationships. So the way that that carries over then to the immigration case is I think our government is perfectly within its rights to pr prioritize or privilege the needs of its citizens when it comes to um, um, uh, doing good, uh, so directing social benefits, um, uh, directing the various kinds of benefits of government toward, um, and that they, they should, they should uh, prioritize the needs of citizens above th that of non-citizens. Or, or in any rate, I think there's a moral case to be made for doing that. Um, so that uh, the government, in a sense, is prioritizing the shalom of its citizens over non-citizens when it comes to allowing harm. They're willing, the government I think would be acting appropriately by allowing harms to non-citizens and first taking care of its citizens. But um, I don't think that that carries over to doing harm. So I don't think the government can go out and wipe out innocent peoples because we need the land um, or, or other kinds of uh, doings of harm. So even though the government has a special obligation toward its citizens, or arguably, that doesn't warrant the doing of harm to innocents to, to uh, satisfy those obligations. So that's how I think about it. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I think what a part of what I hear you you're saying is, is that regardless 
there are alternatives, or there should be alternatives, um, to uh, the rather violent and abusive responses uh, that are being made uh, to the immigration issue. I mean, there's there's no denial that there needs to be some response, mm -hmm. and, and that we, and that and that there is a problem, but it doesn't have to be the rather violent, abusive, coercive response that, that we're seeing uh, now. I, I, would, I would just be interested uh, in, in hearing what those alternatives uh, might, might be. Mm. Um, and I mean, not to put you on the spot, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if you thought that far yeah, yeah. about that, but, but if, if so, I think that would, that, would, that would be just a good way uh, to, to envision something different than what we're seeing today. Yes. I'm afraid I don't have much in the way of concrete policy suggestion. I mean, I, I think a first step would be um, to have a radical program of amnesty and pathway to citizenship for all, all undocumented people in the country, not just DACA recipients, but all. Um, and that, um, and, and that that can be combined with the attempt to still practice robust border security. And th that that would be a strong step in the right direction. Um, I think there are also ways of being much more generous about granting work visas. Um, the uh, economists say we need much, much more robust immigration than we have at all different levels of skill uh, in order to meet the economic needs of our businesses. And so uh, I, I think um, another uh, move would be to dramatically expand the, um, the work visas that are, are issued. Uh, yeah. So I think those are, those are some kind of obvious starting places, but I don't have a grip, a good grip on the various policy options and their implications. Um, so I, I, I can't speculate any further. So thanks for your question. So, so I have a question regarding a comment that you made earlier about prioritizing the needs of like the citizens yes. uh, before undocumented individuals. Um, there was a case not that long ago where an undocumented uh, man needed a kidney, yes. and he was not given given the kidney because mm. of his uh, citizenship st status. So, in that sense, if you have a group of individuals that say all need kidneys, and you are prioritizing the citizens, like just because you're a citizen, you're going to get the kidney first, and because you're undocumented, you're going to be last in line. Wouldn't that technically be causing harm to those? individuals good yeah so I should say that the clearest case of what I'm talking about is so suppose the government collects taxes to use for various kinds of social welfare programs and it has a choice it can send the money to um, wherever uh, uh, a faraway land or it can use the money to care for the in, for indigent US citizens I think there's a strong case to be made that a government is acting within its rights if it uses that money to care for indigent US citizens instead of, instead of sending it to wherever. Um, but now things get trickier where there are people in our midst um, and um, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it, it, my, my grip on the, on the morality of it gets a little fuzzier when it's someone who's here in our immediate vicinity who's in need of a kidney transplant. Um, it's, it, um, but I will say this, it looks to me like if, governing, if government officials did adopt a policy of prioritizing US citizens for kidney transplants over um, non-citizens, that it would not be causing harm, it would be allowing harm. Uh, so I think um, that you have to, um, you have to distinguish the two. So causing harm is, is a matter of actively um, setting in motion a, um, a sequence of events whose direct causal outcome is harm to someone. And I think not giving someone a kidney is, um, not, to, uh, is, is, is not that. Not giving a kidney to someone is like not giving money to someone or not uh, paying attention to someone and, and, and maybe not doing these things results in their being harmed, but it's, I want to say that that falls on the allowing side of the distinction. 
So um, uh, that's a short answer to your question, but it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, um, so one of the more compelling arguments I've heard, um, objections, is raised by um, what you would call regular immigrants okay. who have um, who argue that they stayed in line, they waited in line, uh -huh. and why should someone be able to jump the line? So yes. you could imagine how you could rewrite your parables to account for that sort of thing. So you would have Marvin and Marvina, maybe Marvina uh -huh. waiting in line uh -huh. to set up her place in the marketplace yes. and then Marvin jumping ahead. So I'm wondering what you would, and I never know how to feel about these arguments mm -hmm. when I hear them presented um, powerfully and passionately. Yeah. I mean, part of me wants to say, well, this is just, you know, envy or something like mm -hmm. that. But it seems like there's also an issue of fairness. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just wondered how you would respond to that. I'm not sure how it ties up with the love command. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I need to think more about. Thanks, Terry. It's a, it's a good, it's a good question. So I think there are powerful intuitions of fairness that come into play here. And the, and the thought is, right, I had to wait a long time, and I, and I obeyed all the rules, and so it's not fair that all of a sudden. But I, I think much depends on whether or not, what, is it that I'm waiting in line and you're going to jump ahead of me? You're going to claim a benefit that is not open to me, and so in some sense you're going to put yourself above me? Is it that, or is it more like this, that uh, now, now I'm a citizen or a, or a documented immigrant, and I had to wait a long, long time for it, and now you, without having to wait at all, suddenly you're going to become one, and now we're going to be equal, and that doesn't seem fair to me. If it's, the, if it's the second one, then it's not as clear to me that that's a proper application of principles of fairness. Um, see, I mean, the reason this person uh, is skipping the line is if, if we open the borders on, on grounds of justice, say, the reason this person is skipping the line is because the existence of the line was an injustice. And so it's, it, it's never a matter of fairness that someone should likewise be subject to injustice just because you were subject to injustice. The fairness doesn't require that. And so, so I think that so long as it's a matter of the person being brought to an equal status to yours, not in any way disadvantaging you, and the only issue is they get to skip the injustice that you were subject to, then I think fairness does not require that they have to suffer that injustice, yeah. Can we come back to the uh, doing harm versus allowing harm? Yes. Um, um, I'd like to hear you say a little bit more about that with respect to um, the border buildup that has taken place since the 90s. Um, which, uh, as in terms of the research I've done, um, it's been it's sort of clear that um, borders were placed intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes you'll hear the argument, well, people would stop dying as they try to cross the border if they would stop crossing the border. Um, that seems to be an argument for like allowing harm rather than inflicting harm. Uh, or doing harm, but the borders were placed precisely to send people, it seems, into more dangerous yes. areas. Yeah. And so, um, where they're more likely to die. Yeah. Um, and so I wanna see if you could tease out the allowing versus doing, because uh, it's not clear to me that, that someone couldn't just use your argument to justify the border. Good. You see what I mean? I do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, Michael Humer writes, I think, um, persuasively about this in this paper I mentioned, um, Is There a Right to Immigrate? And so this, this is a line similar to his. What, what I think is that borders are um, an instance of doing harm, not merely allowing it. And so if you think about a parallel case, imagine someone is stuck in an alligator pit and uh, desperately trying to crawl their way out as they're being chased by alligators, and you stand at the edge of the pit in this pose, and, uh, and they bump up against you and fall back in. Um, I, I think you've done uh, harm, not merely allowed it. And you might think that building a wall is, is the um, moral analog of standing at the edge of an alligator 
Now that, that, that's not a fair way of putting it because I don't mean to, it, at all to suggest that, um, that, that uh, countries from which people are immigrating are alligator pits, so that's not my point. Uh, but my point is people are, in many cases, fleeing uh, suffering. And insofar as we stand and push them back into it, uh, we are, I think, doing harm. So to build a wall is to do something whose known causal outcome is harm to shalom. And so thus it's doing harm. I wonder how double effect might play in. So this, I have a question that gets more to the in principled argument um, rather than to the more complex empirical yeah. considerations. So to illustrate, I was thinking about the Starbucks example. Imagine that they play after hours at night, it's dark, and um, periodically people come like banging on the door. Well, they lock the, the door, um, but they realize, you know, maybe, maybe they have some reason to think that uh, oftentimes there's somebody who just like needs some food or they're gonna die, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but not always, and maybe, you know, they have no idea, mm -hmm. it's dark, right? So they wanna do a check. Um, and the reason for doing the check, let's say, is, um, is for some good to protect themselves or whatever, right? Um, out of love for the other players there. Uh, but they, but uh, but it, but it also maybe no, it's known to cause harm sometimes because maybe they have reason to think that on occasion people die of starvation because yeah. they do this, right? Uh -huh. So the, so I'm trying to get at the in principle um, issue, and I don't know if we can separate that from the more complex empirical mm -hmm. questions. Maybe we can't. But, yes, yeah. but you said I'm, so I'm wondering how, what you would say about how the sort of principle of double effect could play in, where you know harm is coming, but that's not your end goal. Yes. Right. Yeah, so there's a couple different issues. One is how to think about double effect reasoning from the standpoint of love command. My thought about that is that the, that the love command is at some deep level incompatible with double effect ethics. Um, so I think if you're, if you're doing something, a known outcome of which is the destruction of someone's shalom, that that goes against the love command, which tells you to seek that person's shalom. Um, and so to me, um, it's not enough that you don't intend this as, as an outcome. If it's a known effect, um, then that's enough to put it into tension with the love command. Um, so I, I, wanna, I, I, want, I want, my view is that at some deep level, double effect reasoning is incompatible with the, love, uh, with the ethics of the love command. But, um, but, but to take the kind of case you have in mind where you lock the door and, um, and sometimes uh, people are, are rattling the door, not because they're in any kind of need or any kind of danger, they just want to get some coffee and, and then they, you know, it's closed and they walk out. And d did you do anything impermissible there? And maybe not, I mean, it, it, it might be that, that there are plenty of cases where it's perfectly permissible to lock the door and, and you haven't wronged anybody. Um, so, so my, the, the, and, and so you might think then that there are some cases where wall, just a mere wall is keeping someone out and you're not wronging that person by virtue of having thus kept them out. Uh, so I, I think it might turn out on my argument that the only people who get wronged by the mere presence of walls are the people who are necessitous or in some way in dire necessity, of whom, now that the empirical stuff kicks in, of whom there are many, many, many. Thanks. Okay, well, it looks like we're at the end of the time. So thank you so much. Thank you all.